<laughs> what else? I can't think of anything else. Do you want to talk about the time you got shut down? The what? The time you got shut down in the first tour. Oh. That was yeah, that was kind of hairy. Um, well, it, uh, it's a harsh lesson <clears throat> when 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 you're dealing with any kind of machinery or any kind of situation where life is at stake it's extremely extremely important to follow procedures and the, there are always extremely serious reasons for procedures and these procedures uh, especially with aircraft they they are lessons learned they aren't something that somebody just decided they're reasons to keep you from dying and this one fella he just didn't follow procedures and he wound up uh, he wound up killing about 14 people because of that he didn't follow procedures and one of the things he did I was the first time I was in Vietnam I was there about three days I didn't know anything and this guy was the boss pilot <clears throat> and we were taking ammunition and supplies loaded to the gills but we I remember we had to bounce that aircraft three or four times to get it off the ground and we were taking a, this load of ammunition and stuff out to uh, infantry on the in the rice paddy lowlands north of where we were stationed uh, that had been surrounded by a large North Vietnamese unit, a, a battalion sized unit. And <clears throat> we tried to go about nine nine or so in the morning and we got about oh, within reach and they told us turn around and go back. There's too much ground fire. Uh, other medevac had tried to get in to get out bodies and wounded and they couldn't get in because of too much ground fire. So we went back and we waited and we waited and we tried one another time about noon, same thing. They turned us back. We went back, refueled and wait and wait. And about three in the afternoon they said you might be able to get in. Two medevacs just now made it. But you cannot fly over the northwest quadrant. Well this was in a, a area of maybe four football fields big rice paddies in that area and they told us not to fly over the northwest quadrant well in the aircraft on both sides the pilot side and the other pilot side there there's an instrument in there that tells you exactly which direction you're going where north south east and west and all the all the cardinal directions of the compass <clears throat> the sad part is when you're flying in in that particular time in Vietnam you had to monitor an FM radio to the troops on the ground right in your immediate area you had to monitor the UHF radio to monitor the artillery fire so you don't fly into and get blown out of the sky by your own artillery fire you had to uh, monitor the VHF radio to make certain that you're not in the flight of a uh, path of an arc light of a B-52 or other uh, Air, Air Force jets attacking some thing or another and sometimes there was a, an, an HF radio that had to be monitored but very seldom so you had always three radios you had to monitor and those radios are very loud and if you turn one off you're gonna miss something that you shouldn't and if you miss that one vital piece of information you could wind up killing yourself well, we were talking to the guys on the ground, and they told us, don't fly over the northwest quadrant. Well, they're popping smoke. They blow a poke of smoke grenade, and it, the wind blows in a certain direction, so you can see what the wind condition is when you land. You, that, uh, with that heavy a load, you certainly do not want to land downwind. You'll just crash. So we could see the smoke, and they told him, don't fly over the northwest quadrant. That's where the, the gun, most of the small arms fire is. He ignored that. He, and I looked over there, he had his number one FM switch turned off. He's listening to the UHF, which is somewhere back 35 miles behind us. He had it on a control tower frequency. They're 35 miles away where we came from. And he's talking to some guy in a tower back there. It has nothing to do with nothing. So I turned his switch off and turned the number one on, and he yelled at me and gave me the dick and said, leave this stuff alone, shut up, I can't hear. 
And I said, hey, you know, you're, you're, talk, you're going exactly where they told you not to. Don't say anything. Just shut up. Just sit there and put, sit on your hands, he told me. Okay. And I thought, this is not good news. Well, by that time, he's turning it in to land. Not only is he in the, over the wrong area, but he's downwind. With this heavy load, this guy's downwind. And I'm thinking, I'm dead. I almost took the controls away from him, but in that situation, had I done that, it would have been a struggle and we'd have probably crashed, so I just sat there wondering how long I was going to live. Well, all of a sudden, it was just that big and that loud, and the engine just quit. 50 caliber machine gun just went across the engine and just wiped it out. It stopped and it got real quiet in there. And we're falling out of the sky as lickety split from about 300 feet. Well, fortunately, we landed in a a rice paddy, and I don't know how that aircraft stayed intact, but it did. Somehow it stayed intact. And when you're sitting in a D-model Huey, it was an old D-model Huey, and when you're sitting in a D-model Huey on the parking ramp, the pilot seat is about almost three to four foot off the ground, three and a half foot off the ground. We had to step up to get off that, get out of that aircraft. It was that far underneath the dirt. And of course, the, the, the rotor system was kind of tilted. It had busted the shaft. But the tail boom, somehow the tail boom stayed, in, stayed intact. Well, everybody got out, and we ran, and they uh, put, uh, they put uh, incendiary grenades on the engine and on the radio avionics the crew. Were, that was the SOP, so it's blowing up. Of course, the fuel cells catch a fire. And as we got about 150, 200 feet away, then the whole thing just blew up and burnt to the ground. But we were running one direction with the infantry, and they were shooting from all different directions. Then they decide, well, there's too much fire, where well, we'd run this other direction. And we just kept changing directions, and I thought, what in the world is this? I, did, I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, just a new guy in country. So I saw these two little guys, they looked like this guy's age. Mm -hmm. they, to me, they, I could have swore they came fresh out of junior high school. They looked like they should have been home eating dinner with mom. Real young kids. But they knew what, I could tell right away, those kids knew what was going on. So I hollered this one kid, I said, what's going on? What do you want me to do? What, what, what do we do? Said, Just follow me and you'll be okay. Follow me and you'll be okay. I said, Roger Dodger, kid, I'm right behind you. So I followed those two kids everywhere. Never got a scratch on me. And we, we ran and ran and ran and ran. I don't know, if this was like three in the afternoon. It was after five before we finally stopped running. And we wound up inside of a rice paddy about twice, oh, maybe about the size of a football field. And it had a large five-foot berm of ground all around it. And we no more than got in there, and in the center of that rice paddy, boom, 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 three mortar rounds went off but didn't hurt anybody. And this one little kid that I was sitting there with, this real young kid, he looks out there with his compass where that gun was firing, and he's talking to this other little kid that's wearing the radio, and he's blah, 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 and he's telling him the other kid, he's talking on the radio, blah, 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 within, well within one minute, out there where that gun was, blah, 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 there's no way an ant could have survived that. <laughs> and we got no more mortar rounds the rest of the night. The artillery, they talked to them on the radio. They danced that artillery around that rice paddy all night long, or I wouldn't be sitting here. If it wasn't for those two little kids, there's no way I'd be sitting here. But they kept that artillery going around that rice paddy all night long. The next morning, they called it off, and they went out there, and there were bodies everywhere, and they all wearing black pajamas. And I, we moved around. Oh, within about a couple of miles of that place, you know, scouting around to see what was, if anything was left, kind of a cleanup operation. Never, there was nothing left. But I counted 70 guys that were alive of ours, 70 guys, and that was what was left of three infantry companies. And an infantry company was about 130 to 150 guys, depending on the type of company. That's what was left with three of, from three of those. And they'd been out there for a week against those guys that they did in with that artillery. But that guy, he survived that right along with me and then other than the crew. And they came and picked us up that next day about 
oh, it was a little after noon, and took us back, and they, they just gave us another aircraft and said, get out there, do some more. So we went out to that same spot and we hauled bodies and rations and more bodies and stuff the rest of the day. The very following, the very day, that same day, a week later, that same guy went out and uh, did an insertion where they drop troops in. They take about 15 or 20 aircraft and drop in 15 or 20 aircraft worth loads of guys and go back and get another 15 or 20. And everybody was supposed to break right after you dropped your load, break right toward the, the ocean. He didn't. He broke left and they shot him out of the sky with nine people on board. He took out people in extraction. Killed nine people plus the crew. That's 10, 11, 12, 13 people. So it pays when you're in any kind of a situation like that, there are procedures you have to follow, and those, those procedures are to save your life, to keep you from, from dying. And they're not just rules somebody arbitrarily writes up. Those procedures come from experience to preclude something happening again that happened before. And it doesn't make any difference how old a soldier is. The very, very youngest sometimes are the ones that save the, the whole group. Those two little kids saved my butt. If it weren't for those two little kids, a lot of guys, and, and including me, would not be walking around today because those two little kids were trained and they did their job. And I knew nothing, but I knew I had sense enough to follow somebody that looked like they knew what was going on. I didn't care how old they were. <laughs>